Next up, we have um, Cara Santa Maria. Uh, uh, her talk is called Science with a Side of Atheism, uh, Skepticism Out in the Open. She, was, uh, she used to be a senior science correspondent for the Huffington Post. Uh, her haiku is seven syllables, Cara Santa Maria, perfect second line. Please welcome to the stage, Cara Santa Maria. Hi everyone. So I think I'm gonna cut my talk a little bit short so that I can get some more kind of interaction. I'm really hoping that there's a mic out in the audience or that we can wing this so that we can have more conversation. I much prefer to talk with people than to talk at people. And I'm not gonna lie, but I was kind of up until 5 a.m. playing poker last night. I think that's kind of the risk of doing a skeptic convention in a casino, like what do you expect really? And I have to prepare because I'm gonna be playing in the poker tournament tomorrow night and hopefully a lot of you guys are gonna join. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I kind of wanted to um, introduce myself first and mostly I think I'm gonna spend the time that I have today, what little time I have, kind of talking to you about who I am and how I came into what it is that I do because TAM is a really exciting um, experience for me. This is my first time here. A lot of times when I give talks, I either specifically give talks at science conferences or I specifically give talks at atheist conventions. And so this is super interesting for me because the science, the skepticism, the atheism, it all's kind of coming together in this great group of people and it makes it really hard to focus and figure out what it is I, I you know, really want to talk about. So I figure, you know, I'm the embodiment of all three. I'm gonna talk about me. Hopefully that doesn't bore you guys too much. So I wanted to start by telling you a little bit of who I am and what I do and why the organizers of this event, the wonderful organizers even thought to, to call me up and, and ask me to come speak to you guys today. So my name is Cara Santa Maria. Uh, those of you in the audience who do know me most likely know me either from my work that I do with the Young Turks um, which is an online news organization, a progressive online news organization, or with the work that I previously did with the Huffington Post. <gasps> Gasp. Um, so I started at HuffPost um, probably about two years ago. I just left in April to pursue more kind of TV and online opportunities. But when I started at the Huffington Post, they didn't have a science page. And I thought it was really important that they have a science page, because let's be real, they needed a science page. <laughs> And, and, you know, uh, what we really kind of aimed to do when I first went there was to make a safe haven. You know, we had no control over what went on in the health pages. We had no control over what went on with specific bloggers that showed up all around the site. There's like 50 verticals on that site and every vertical has a different editor. But we thought if we start a science page, we can have a home where there's no woo, where evidence-based thinking can live. And so that's what we set out to do. And I started a video series there called Talk Nerdy to Me, um, where I would talk nerdy. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it ran the gamut. Really, I was this, the science correspondent. My background is in neuroscience. I'll get to that. Um, but they really wanted me to focus on all things science, so long as they didn't step on the toes of the green pages or the health pages. So. I would focus on space stories, I would focus on brain stories, kind of new news in the sciences, but I always snuck in a little bit of that skepticism. I did a piece about what happens when you die. I did a piece about whether or not prayer really works. I did a piece, probably one of my favorites, about the power of positive thinking. Um, and, and I really like to focus on those kind of evergreen stories, those stories that sort of fly in the face of what I think the general public, and especially on the left, you know, I, I'm not going to claim to know the political affiliations of most of the people in the audience, but I have a feeling we're a little left-leaning. And, um, and it's funny how much woo really does exist on the left. You know, we think about the right and the climate deniers and the anti-evolutionists, but, you know, the anti-vaxxers kind of live on the left, and, and especially the anti-GMO people, they live on the left. And, and sometimes I think it's really important to, to stand up for those things even when it's your, your people, it's your audience, because they're not getting a good dose of that. So, so basically, that's kind of where I'm coming from. I, I've done a lot of television. I did a pilot for HBO called Talk Nerdy to Me when I first started out in this field, um, which ultimately got, got folded into my Huffington Post series. I've appeared on 
Larry King and on The Nerdist and on um, some old CNN shows, Parker Spitzer, things like that back when they were around. Attack of the Show on G4, if any of you guys watched that. Woohoo! Uh, <laughs> and, and now I'm basically freelancing. I've done some work for Sundance Channel, for Travel Channel, for Nat Geo, and I'm about to start uh, a new venture on a new network um, that will be launching in August. I'm going to be working on their daily show. So I'm super excited about that. Um, the transition there for me came from science into news, current events, and politics. And again, I'll talk a little bit about why, um, why I think that's an important transition for me. But before I, before I focus on what it is that I'm doing now and why it is that I'm doing what I'm doing now, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I got here because I am an American atheist. But I was born as a Texan Mormon. <laughs> so my folks at the time were married, at the time were Mormon. My last name is Santa Maria. I can't think of a more Catholic last name than that. My father's Italian, my mother's Puerto Rican. They were tried and true Catholics who converted together and joined the LDS church. And you know, it's funny, while I was playing poker last night, I think I got a lot of insight talking to some of the folks at the table and to this one very interesting gentleman who claims to have walked on water. Um, he was fun. Uh, and, and, and I talked a little bit about, you know, why it is that I think the LDS church seems to be so attractive. And in some ways, I find myself not defending it. It is still very much a part of my family, which is difficult because, you know, it's bullshit. And it's, it's really easy for me to say that. But I, I understand a little bit why people swallow the bullshit in the Mormon church. And that's because in order to have an answer for everything, the answers start to get really crazy. Now, people who are raised Catholic, I think, struggle with this idea of Okay, the Trinity, it's like God, and he gave birth to himself, and that's really confusing, and he's also a ghost that kind of hangs around. I don't get it. And then the answer is always, oh, well, God works in mysterious ways, and you've got to have faith, and, you know, that's going to help you out. And, and I think that probably my parents, to some extent, they really started on that path of being truth seekers, and I think that they were struggling with this idea, and, and they were interested in finding answers and coming from this kind of safe place in the Catholic Church where they were confused all of the time, where, where, where God works in mysterious ways was not satisfactory to them anymore, they stumbled upon the Mormon Church. Well, in the Mormon Church, there is an answer to every question you might ask. Well, how can God b give birth to his son? Oh, well, or how can God give birth to himself? Well, it's not him. The Trinity is three separate beings. That's what they teach in that church. And how is it that we can interpret this scripture as inheriting our own kingdoms after we do? Oh, well, you just get your own planet. It's a good deal for you. And, and, and it starts to get kind of insane, but the reason it's insane is because that curious kid who shows up to Sunday school and goes, I don't get this. How does this work? What's the answer to this? There's always an answer. And it feeds you, and you start to get more interested, which is why I held on until I was about 14. So I was baptized at eight because, of course, in the LDS church, eight is the age of consent. We all make the best decisions of our lives when we're eight years old. Um, I guess it's better than being an infant and having no choice in the matter. But let's be honest, what eight-year-old isn't just trying to impress their parents, isn't just trying to do what they think their parents want them to do? So I was baptized. I went through the gamut. I baptized dead people. You guys have heard of this, right? It's weird. They're not actually like dead bodies in the font or anything like that. These people are long dead. Um, but yeah, I did that. I feel bad about that. Like I converted people after they died. I mean, I know it's all bullshit anyway and it really has no effect, but looking back, it's kind of a weird thing. Um, and so, so I was in that church, I was really in it, you know, Sunday for three hours, Wednesday for two hours, Monday family home evening, every day before school from at 6 a.m., going to seminary, studying the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, the Doctrine and Covenants. And around the time that I was 14, I came to my father. My parents were divorced at this point. My mother, I lived with my mother, but my father had joint custody and I went to his house um, for all of those times that I mentioned to be engaged in church activities. And, and I went to my father and I said, you know, Dad, I don't, I don't think I believe in God. I'm, I'm questioning this a lot. I'm a little confused about it. And 
you know, like the good Mormon that he was, he said, well, Kara, I have a moral obligation to God to force you to go to church until you're 18 as long as you live under my roof. And being the kind of, let's say, revolutionary 14-year-old that I was, I said, well, I guess I can maybe won't live under your roof anymore. It was a tough decision to make at that time. It, was, it was, really was a Sophie's choice. But in so many ways, I liken this unto anybody else who's coming out for any other reason. It's so hard to pretend like you're something that you're not year after year after year. And I think it really starts to take a piece of you away. And at that point in my life, and I don't regret this decision, I knew that I couldn't do this anymore and that I was willing to risk a relationship with the person that I was supposed to trust most in my life. It's a lot kind of to be on the, on the shoulders of a, of a teenager, but it was that important to me. And since then, you know, we've kind of reestablished our relationship. We didn't, we didn't speak for many years, but um, I'm feeling much better about things, things now, even though there's always lingering issues. And I'm sure many of you have dealt with that in the audience. Many of you who decided to leave your church, whatever church that may be, and were raised in the South, like I was in Texas, or raised in the Bible Belt, raised in, in, in a kind of controlling environment, and disappointed your parents in doing so. And, and it, it's a tough place to be, but I think it's a testament to your strength, and, um, and I think that you guys are great examples. I try to be an example for those kids who kind of feel like they're maybe a little lost, like all they know are other people in the church and, and something just doesn't feel right. I think it's really important to kind of be true to yourself regardless of, of how you do it and what that means to you. So the interesting thing for me is that the atheism came first, long before the science. I don't know if the atheism informed the science. I don't know if the science reestablishes the atheism. I think probably there's, there's an intermediate variable at play, you know, a confounding variable that is just this kind of angsty, anti-spirit, this questioning spirit, this, this personality trait that says, I want to know the truth and I don't care who is feeding me these lies. I don't care if it's going to get me in trouble. I don't care if it's going to cause me grief, but I need to understand. And so, you know, I started school, checking on my time here. Oh my God. No. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I was like, I have not been going for 30 minutes. Only 10, only 10. We're good. Um, I started school, I, I started college um, with an intention of studying vocal jazz performance, like, you know, every normal child does. Um, went to college at 16, started studying, studying music. I went to the University of North Texas, an amazing school for jazz music. Uh, quickly realized that I hate playing piano. And you gotta really be pretty good at piano to, to major in what I wanted to major. And got lazy, smoked a lot of pot. Decided that, you know, I'll get a psych degree. <laughs> Why not? That seems easy enough. And, uh, and I started focusing on psychology. I, I really focused on it. I decided to get a Bachelor of Science as opposed to a Bachelor of the Arts so that I could understand the scientific method a little bit, take some extra coursework in research methodology, write a thesis. I got involved with a neuropsychologist in my kind of junior, senior year and started seeing patients with brain damage and became fascinated by their stories, fascinated by uh, the, the situations they found themselves in, fascinated by linking how they were as people, by linking their behavior and their personalities to what had happened to them traumatically or to how they had had difficulties with development. And ultimately, uh, I decided that I wanted to know more. So I stuck around, I got a master's degree in neurobiology where I specifically focused on um, cell culture techniques and, and kind of some Parkinson studies. And after that, I went to New York, uh, thought that I would get my PhD in clinical neuropsychology, fell in love with a boy, moved to LA, never finished the PhD. You know, life takes you on turns. Um, but, it, but it really opened a lot of interesting doors for me because I found that I always really loved being in the classroom. I loved teaching. I didn't so much love being at the microscope. I didn't so much love having to sacrifice mice every day. Um, I knew it was important. It was a part of the work that I do. I'm a huge advocate of animal research, of course. Um, and and I'm, I'm proud of the work that I did, but I don't think it was for me. I, I like teaching. And I realized that kind of, if I go through the media, I can teach a lot more people and I can teach them in more creative ways. So, so that's really how I made that transition into doing things on the web and doing things on television 
and doing podcasts and trying to get out there and communicate science in that way. So I, I mostly focused, as I said, I was, I was working as the senior science correspondent for HuffPost and I was focused on uh, kind of the hard sciences. But then I started getting involved with the Young Turks. And that was really exciting for me because I started to realize that I was sort of in an echo chamber. We'll pretend like we're not in an echo chamber right now. Um, <laughs> but I started to realize that when you communicate science, sometimes you're lucky enough to do a video that goes viral. You're lucky enough to do a story that a kind of an outside outlet picks up and, and shares around the web. But a lot of times, you're talking to people who are interested in hearing stories about science. And really, I wanted to reach those people who maybe don't think they want to learn about science or maybe don't really know that there are atheists out there in the world. And so I started to get involved doing more kind of political reporting. And I love it. I love talking about current events. I love talking about what's going on in the news. And I specifically always try to maintain this focus on evidence-based thinking, critical thinking, on thinking scientifically about things that aren't necessarily scientific. Because I am much less concerned about the kids. Kids are scientists. Kids are naturally scientists. They're curious. I mean, kids have the traits that scientists have. They're born with them. We beat it out of them, usually. But most of the time, at a young enough age, kids are already exploring the natural world the way that scientists like to do. I'm really concerned about the adults. I'm concerned about, about their parents. And I'm concerned about people who, who show up and they walk into that voting booth. I want those people to be able to exercise their skeptical minds. I want those people to understand how to make decisions based on available evidence. And that is what I'm always trying to communicate. That's what I do as a science communicator. That's why I think science literacy needs to be improved in this country. Not because I think we need to make new scientists. There will always be people, amazing people, who will do science. But everybody should have the gift of thinking scientifically. Everybody should be able to wear that lens that turns a light bulb on, that illuminates dark corners, and that squashes the fear that comes along with not knowing. You know, people talk about this, this concern that as soon as you know how things work, it's gonna take the magic out of them. Well, no offense to, uh, to James, but I, I, I don't mind living in a world without real magic. I want to live in the world where we understand why. Because when we understand why, there aren't any monsters under our beds anymore. There's a lot less to be afraid of. So, where am I? Ah, well, I'm pretty much there. So, so, so that brings me to today. And I kind of already mentioned why it is, um, or how it is that I, that I got into this, this realm, into this kind of science meets news, meets current events, meets skepticism, meets atheism. I don't know, it's a whole weird mishmash. Mostly, I just know how to be me. I talk the way that I talk, and so far that has served me well. I hope it continues to. I know that this room is a room full of people who I think hold similar values. And it's a room full of people who at whatever level, are doing their part to do the same thing that I'm trying to do. I have a media platform, and I'm very grateful for that. I'm very lucky to have that, and I hope that I can hold on to that. The way that I try to hold on to that is to be as genuine as possible and to really speak from the heart. But everybody in this room, I know, does the same thing that I do. Whether you do it on the web or you do it around the kitchen table or you do it around the water cooler, I urge you not to be afraid. And I urge you to kind of come out of the darkness and to speak about these things with people who may not understand that skeptics, that atheists are moral beings. People who need to see strong examples so that we're no longer ranked lower on a self-report survey than rapists. I'm not sure if you remember that study that came out maybe about five years ago where individuals 
rank ordered a bunch of different types of people, and atheists were ranked lower in trustworthiness than rapists. And the reason for that is because people don't understand. They don't know that the guy living next door, the guy who they borrow you know, sugar from and who's loaned them their lawnmower, is an atheist. They don't know where we are because we're hiding oftentimes in these dark corners because we're still not accepted. Now, I like to speak about science, about skepticism, and about atheism out loud, not because I'm trying to convert, that's not even the right word, unconvert people, not because I'm trying to bring more into my fold, it's not a fold, it's not an organization, it's a lack thereof, but because I, I think that we really are in an, in an era right now where this is, is probably going to be the next big civil rights movement because we're still living in a culture where just saying that you don't believe in God prevents you from getting elected to public office. We're saying that you don't believe in God could prevent you from getting a job. You know, we need to stand up and show people that we're just like everyone else. We don't have horns. We're not going to hell. We don't believe in hell, so that would be difficult. And we're strong, moral people. We have values, we have families, we give back to our community. All of those things are important. And you know why we do it? Because we want to, not because we fear eternal retribution. There's no better reason than that. So I want to thank you guys so much for listening to my story, brief as it was, because what I'd really like to do now, and I hope that you guys <laughs> actually have questions or comments or, or any way to join the conversation, I'd love to be able to open it up to that. Um, because like I said, I don't think it's really that interesting to be talked at for a half hour. I'd rather speak with you. It's very hard for me to see though, and I also don't know if there's a moderate, oh. Look at that. Cheers. Thanks Hi. so much. <laughs> you know what, let's do what we did last year really quick so we can not block anyone's view. Let's form a line right here real quick. So come on up, we'll take our first one right here. We're gonna form a line right this way. And that way you can see them and Perfect. we're good to go. Science editor at Huffington Post. Correspondent, about... correspondent, not the I, editor. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to make that clear because it sounds kind of like going into the belly of the beast. I wondered if you would expand a little bit on how much you flack you got for that from some of the other, you said you had to stay away from medicine, you had to stay away from Deepak Chopra or whatever. Um, how did that work out for you? Yeah, um, you know what, what's interesting, anybody here in the crowd today, uh, kind of a member of the Science Online community? Sayo, woohoo, Science Online? No, okay. Well, Science Online is a great group of people who meet up every year and basically who, who communicate science online. They write blogs, they make videos, they're very engaged. And we, we have a conference every year. The very first year that I went was two years ago. I was invited by Bora Zivkovich, he was the blog editor at Scientific American. And he said, I want you to come to this conference and you will have a target on your back. Just, psh, David Dobbs is gonna grill the hell out of you. Carl Zimmer is gonna be pissed off. And, and I said, okay, I'll go, I'll go, I'll, I'll take a bullet. And that was a big part of, of what I did <laughs> as the science correspondent for the Huffington Post is operate in this weird middle space where I was kind of trying to defend the post, but I was also trying to make sure that the public and that the scientific community understood where I was coming from. And for the most part, I was really surprised and, and pleasantly surprised and impressed to see how many people within the HuffPost community saw what I did there as a breath of fresh air and really appreciated what I was doing there. Interestingly enough, one of my closest, um, or I should say most interesting <laughs> colleagues there was a religion reporter and he was a really good reporter and was always really interested. We learned so much from each other. He did such a good job reporting religion. Uh, we talked like for hours on end about, about the LDS church. He would call me when he needed to make sure that, you know, help with fact checking and things like that. So, um, so it was tough, but I really didn't have that much direct communication with the editors that were giving people like Jenny McCarthy and Deepak Chopra a mouthpiece. 
Um, I, I, I had to be a little bit um, diplomatic. You know, when I did the piece about the power of positive thinking, I talked about Eckhart Tolle, I talked about Deepak Chopra, I talked about um, uh, Robbins. I didn't so much talk about Oprah, because I want to have a career. I mean, it was tough, you know, because she was very much involved with HuffPost, and, and I wanted her picture to be the lead picture about why the power of positive thinking movement is just destroying America. But it is tough sometimes. You have to kind of make those kinds of decisions, but, but you don't want to make those kinds of decisions um, at the risk of the content. And so, as, as careful as I had to be, I think I was very lucky in that regard. I'll keep my answer shorter, sorry. <laughs> hey, Kara, my name's Steven. Um, Hi, Steven. I was surprised how many first tamers we have here uh, last night at the uh, Baxter and Brian show last mm -hmm. night. Um, can you talk a little bit uh, about for, maybe for first tamers or atheists that are still kind of in the closet or so the uh, science-based science, science -based, uh, believers, uh, how do they come out of the closet? What's the first steps? How do they not necessarily get involved in starting their own podcast mm -hmm. or all those advanced steps, but those, uh, those just kind of how do you let people around you know it's not okay to disparage atheists or to to talk about the great wonder of homeopathy and oh God. all those things. <laughs> Thank you. Right, it's not easy, it's not easy. And for me, I mean, I think for me it was about coming out to my parents. I think that was the first big step. Um, but it's tough, you know, I have a lot of LGBT friends and uh, I know that kind of a mantra in the LGBT community, which I think is an important mantra, is that you don't have to tell anybody you don't want to tell. Like, it's your life, it's your decision. And I do feel very strongly about that when we're talking about your belief structure too. If you're a very private person and you don't want to do that, I, I'm not saying that you're doing anything wrong for not coming out and, and speaking up. But those of you who do and who set a really good kind of example in your community are, are helping those, those who are kind of scared and kind of hiding to be able to feel more comfortable to do that. And so I think things like this are a great first step. Finding like-minded individuals, finding them. It's, that's one of the best things about living in the internet age is that you can actually find people who have the same ideals as you have. When, when you might have grown up in a small southern town where you literally didn't know anybody who didn't go to church, now all of a sudden you can go to an ex-Mormon chat room and meet people all across the country who are dealing with the same things that you're dealing with. And so I think the first thing is finding your community. The first thing is, is finding people that you trust, that you can kind of confide in. And what happens is that you start to kind of gain a strength from that and you start to feel less like you're going to fall without a safety net if you do speak up. And you start to realize that, well, if I tell people that I don't believe and they hate me for that, if I tell them that I don't believe and they don't want to have anything to do with me anymore, why was I friends with those people to begin with? And, and so I think you know, developing a cushion and, and putting, putting people around you that are open-minded and that are interested is probably the first, uh, the first step to that. Hi, thank Hi. you. Um, I love what you're saying. Thank uh, you. I'm a United Methodist minister. Um, I, I'm left wing, I did a gay marriage back in 1971. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering if, if um, you believe that the empirical paradigm does explain how everything works. Uh. Um, is that a theory supported by the empirical research or is it a statement of faith? I think that this is a really good question and, and it's something that I didn't really clarify. I clarified it last night at the poker table, it's all blurring together. Um, I didn't really clarify it up here, but I feel very strongly, I call myself an atheist and the reason I call myself an atheist is for, for simplicity's sake. I got some tweets this morning from people like, atheism is militant and agnosticism is the only true way. And you know, truth be told, we're all agnostic. I feel very strongly about this. We are all agnostic because it is impossible to use scientific methodology. Science is the study of the natural world. You cannot study anything metaphysical or supernatural by definition with the tools of science. Now some people will say it's because it's not there. Other people will say, maybe it is there, but I can't interact with it in that way. There's no way to gain empirical evidence about something that by definition is ineffable and untestable. That being said, I think we all live our lives either as theistic agnostics or atheistic agnostics. For me, 
The idea of a God doesn't factor into my daily life. The idea of being watched over, of a great plan, is not necessary. I'm not saying that science, comp like, I'm not saying that you can disprove God through scientific methodology, but I think that scientific methodology does put me in a position, at least, to, to look at the world that I live in, look at the universe that I live in, and say, God is not necessary to explain kind of the grandeur of the universe. Actually, I've got to wrap up, but I have a quote. My most recent tattoo is like big and it's down my ribs. And if you watch this episode of Star Talk Radio with Neil deGrasse Tyson um, at Live at the Bell House, I'm talking about it in that episode. And he like drags me to the front of the stage and like lifts up my shirt to show off my tattoo. And somebody in the audience is like, how did you know she had that? Neil was like, she told me, come on. Um, but I have this tattoo on my ribs, and it's a quote by Carl Sagan, and it says, we are a way for the cosmos to know itself. And for me, that's a really beautiful statement because a lot of people, I think, want to feel like there is a greater consciousness, like the cosmos itself has some sort of design, some sort of plan. I don't believe in a collective consciousness. I don't believe in anything supernatural. And I love this because it's so poetic and it gives you, it gives me that spiritual, I never use that word because it like is meaningless to me. It's an eye roll every time I hear the word spiritual, it drives me crazy. But th that, whatever that is, those chills that you get, this idea that because we can contemplate on our place in the universe, and we are made of the stuff of stars. We are made of the same material that was produced in the furnace of a star being born, that we, in essence, are a way for the cosmos to know itself. That thought to me is humbling enough and fantastic enough and amazing enough that I don't need God in my life to be able to explain why I'm here and, and, and what this all means. But ultimately, I think it is important that I make that distinction. I am an atheist agnostic. And you, sir, are a theistic agnostic. <laughs> and thank you for your comments. Thank you guys so, so much for coming. <laughs>